Mario Arias. Yes. All right. Uh, he's on the AppSec team at Tyro. And uh, his talk, uh, security, we left in the right direction. He is currently a software engineer over there, formerly a security champion from what I hear. Yes. I love those guys. <laughs> um, and he's a passion for security and open source. He's been dabbling with a little bit of Rayman, a little bit of Zap Proxy. Uh, and he's got a whole bunch of things to talk about today. Yes. So take it away. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, can you? Um, I think the slides are not sure. Oh, yes. I can. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. Perfect. Do you want the lights dark? Yeah, a little bit dark. Oh, it's actually off. Okay, so the, there's only off. It's off. Yep. <laughs> it's mood lighting. <laughs> cool. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I'm going to talk about uh, application security and why um, left is the right direction. So to start, that it's better now. Uh, to start, I'll talk a little bit about me. Um, I'm a software developer. I have been a software developer for 10 years. Um, I have worked in a past life as a consultant. I work um, in four different countries as well. So I could see uh, lots of companies uh, doing security and doing agile uh, at the same time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I do application security at Tyro. So the team missions we have is to empower developers to build secure codes, to build a secure product. I'm also an agile enthusiast. I truly believe in the Agile Manifesto. I truly believe that can help us to deliver better software, better secure software as well. And I do uh, open source contributions from time to time. Some of the projects like Zaproxy, FindSec Bugs, Breakman, from time to time I can contribute to those. All right, I'm gonna talk a, lot, a little bit about everything here, but of course, uh, focus more on application security. So a little bit of an agenda. I'll start with a definition. Um, I think if you, um, some people watch uh, Matt's talk about like how application security is kind of a confusing field, so like I'll try to make this a little bit more clear. Um, why you should do application security at all? How we try to do some of the practices we can uh, uh, can do it, and who who is the, who is responsible, who is accountable for application security? So let's get started. Um, the definition, right? So if we put in Google application security definition, one of the first definitions you're going to see is the one from Wikipedia, where it says like it's a, a, a group of measurements to improve application security to find, fix, and prevent secure vulnerabilities, which is kind of like yeah, it's kind of there, but like I'm not I'm not 100% confident that's the, the right definition. Then I found another one from this guy, uh, Gary McGraw. I don't know if you, if you heard about him. He's a very known author, secure author, um, wrote many books around security, especially about um, software security. And he came up with a much better definition. He says application security is more reactive, where software security is a proactive approach taking place before the pre-deployment phase. I think that's that's the main thing. Um, most of the application security should happen before the deployment phase. It shouldn't be reactive, should come before the, uh, the deployment. And then you can see like the Wikipedia and his definition like are kind of similar, but I like his definition better where he does more emphasis on the proactive approach. All right, now we know uh, what application security is. Why should we do it, right? Well, besides the very basic um, reason that it's not get hacked, um, it comes down as well uh, the cost to fix bugs. If you have a vulnerability, there's a bug in your software. That shouldn't be happening. It's not, it's not very different from other uh, regular bugs. The difference between a secure bug and a regular bug is there is some people trying actively to find these bugs and use against you. So for this kind of bugs, you have the implementation bugs. They're usually inexpensive to fix. So that's your no pointer exception that's happening in your backend. That's your uh, SQL injection that's happening. So as soon as you find those, it's usually pretty easy to fix. As soon as you see there's a vulnerability there, you do the sanit sanitization, remove the null, and everything goes all right. But you also have the architectural bugs, and these are usually a lot more um, expensive to fix. 
Um, for example, if you have an application that uh, the design was for a, a few hundred users and then you try to make now for a few thousand users, you have such a hard job to, to fix that, right? Like if you, who, who is here a developer, by the way? Okay, so I have quite a few developers. So I think like you guys understand what I'm talking about. When you try to change architecture for a software that's already in production, that's already working, it's a lot of work. On top of that, you have where you find this bug. So if you go more to the left, you go, for example, you don't, you don't write the bug in the first place. You know it's a, a bad practice, you just don't write it. That's the, the, um, the best bug to, to have ever. Sorry. Um, because like then it's free, you, you didn't write the bug at all. But if you do write the bug, you want to catch it in early. So for example, you're doing pre-programming, and then in the pre-programming, your pair look at the code you just wrote and say, hey, wait a minute, I think there's a bug here. There's a little bit of a cost, but it's still not much. As, as long as you go to the right, when you put the code in production, then it makes harder to fix. It might, like some people might be using this, uh, this bug of yours as a feature, that happens. You can have uh, other services using your, um, your bug as well. And if it's in production for such a long time, then you can have even futures built on top of that bug. And to fix that, now it's a lot harder to fix, it's a lot more expensive. So just to give an example about that, a bit of story time. Uh, I was working in this company where they have um, architecture, where they have a, a server, that's what they call master, and an agent, right? They have multiple agents with one master. So at some point back in the past, they want to share sensitive data between the master and the agent. So they want to uh, do some encryption to share the data, which is good, right? Like, that's a, a security conscious person. But the developer at the time, he hard-coded the password in both master and the agent. So they have the same password, like using, using a symmetric key, the same key in both master and the agent, which I know for these rooms, probably everybody knows like that's a bad practice, but the developer at the time didn't know it. He didn't know better. So a few years later, I joined the company and then I was going to the code and I found this hard code password. I was like, what is that about? I came and talked to the developer and said, hey mate, what is that? Like, what's the reason to have a hard code password? He said, oh, I don't know how to share keys between the master and the agent. So I just hard coded them. And then I was like, okay, but have thought about like asymmetrical keys, like private and public uh, key pairs. Uh, then you can share the public key. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, now you say it, it's a bit obvious, but like the code is now in production. That kind of software was not on, cl on cloud, it was on-prem, which means there are clients already using this code, encrypt information with that key, which we don't have any control about. And of course, there were all the features built on top of that. So to fix that bug, it required us lots and lots of work to get that done, and we just cannot just replace the old code because the old files that are encrypted, they're still using the previous key. You cannot just come up with a new way to do encryption and break your clients, right? That's a breaking change. So th just to give an idea, if this bug was catched on the very beginning when he was developing, when he's thinking about the solution, somebody come to him and say, hey, wait a minute, I have tried this, this or that, the story would be different. We wouldn't have like this problem. But now we had this uh, big problem and because we just allow the bug to go all through to production and for a few years. All right, so we, now, we know why, right? We want to fix as early as possible, get rid of the bugs, but how, how we do that? So everything comes down to software development lifecycle, right? But software development lifecycle is something that's very unique for each corporation. So just like put a simple software development lifecycle here, very simple so we can have a baseline for the talk. But like, of course, it's um, very more, um, a lot more complex than that. So usually what you do have is some people come up with some ideas, right? You have like marketing people, sales people, uh, product managers, they come up with an idea and say like, oh, I want to develop this feature or that other feature. They eventually goes to a manager, management side that you're gonna get this idea and then like, okay, I have this backlog of ideas already. So I need to prioritize and then come up with some kind of um, schedule to the development team. 
Then the managers, they go, to, in order to do that process, they usually talk to the senior technical people from that team, architects, tech leads, or just uh, very senior developers, to get an idea of estimation. Like, um, what do you think? This is a two weeks feature, this is one month, this is six months, this is a year. Then the, when it eventually goes to the team, the team helps the design uh, together with the uh, senior technical people. They help the design and they implement eventually to the client, right? Of course, and again, this is usually a lot more complex. There's a lot of back and forth here, but just to give an idea like of a very simple software development lifecycle. And then if you think about it, uh, there is like two, four areas that I want to address here and how to do application security on the software development lifecycle. Start with the most left one, that's the learning process. That's why you don't write the bug at all because you know that's bad. So how we do security by learning? Well, first one is training, right? Uh, I think like some people right, uh, address that here. So if you have like, uh, if your developers are writing lots of uh, SQL injection, JavaScript injection, you should provide them training so they don't do anymore. You don't want to get that in a pen test report. As soon as you, you understand that's happening in your inside organization, you should flow that back to your training and don't, don't do that at all, right? But then this is time consuming and requires budget. That's why the managers, uh, they need to look, uh, find the time and the budget to the development teams and the, the, the technical people have um, the right training. Uh, then you have capture the flags. Who, who here knows what capture the flag is? Okay, some people don't know. So capture the flag is a very common security where you have a set of challenges and exercises that uh, they are make available to you with a vulnerability. And inside these challenges, these applications, they have a flag that you need to get. In order to get the flag, you need to spot the vulnerability. And it's a competition. You have like multiple people trying to hack the same applications and try to get the flag, right? Uh, what, it, what we're trying to do at Taro is make the developers participate in capture the flag competitions. And this is a ver very powerful because when they go to the training, they understand like, oh, okay, just, that's how JavaScript injection works. That's how SQL injection works. But how to actually exploit that? So it's a very powerful exercise for them to see, oh, okay, so if I have a JavaScript injection, I, get, I can get the cookie sometimes, I can change the page itself, I can send some information, I can send other requests on behalf of the user. So they can notice like how bad it is the vulnerability when it comes down to fix it, when it's, you tell a like, security team comes to the developer and say, hey, I found a secure vulnerability here. You might want to fix it. He have a much better understanding like, oh, okay, like I, I know what it is, I know how bad it is. So it's been like uh, running entirely quite successfully. Like uh, how developers that participate uh, have a, a good feedback about that. Um, but then you have a little bit of consulting as well because trainings can only go so far. We know how we, we all know that, right? Developers they don't they only care about security. They also uh, care about like performance, the infrastructure, and cloud, and how other stuff that needs to be that required to to your um, application. So there are some times that the security team needs to do some consulting with the developers to try to figure out what they're trying to do and how to mitigate some risks. And, and I think that's pretty important. One of the problems that I see uh, with security, there are some security teams that are considered blockers. So the developers come to them and ask for help, like, oh, I want to do this or that. And the, develop, and the security says, no, 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 that's, that's wrong, that you're not going to do it. Like that creates friction. You know, one, the only thing that's going to happen is the, the developer teams, they're not going to talk to you anymore. They're just going to move away. They're going to go to the, uh, do their job without talking to security, which is bad for everybody. So what, what we try to do instead is rather than say no, you say yes, of course you can do that. But have you thought about this, this, and that? Have you thought about these risks? Have you thought about like what the attacker can try to do with that? Have tried, how, what the mitigations are in place for that? So on and so forth. Um, so that's, that's quite important. Then you build the re this relationship with the developers and then have a board wings. Just to give an example of secure by learning. So Taro has this challenge, uh, Docker run challenge. You can run that at home if you want. It's a, it's a Docker container that you download your, your machine and there is lots of vulnerabilities and eventually you need to get the flag. There's a flag in there. There's a Google form if you want to apply to Tyro eventually. Um, 
But well, the interesting thing about that is uh, I was already in Tyro when they came up with this exercise and they, they sent internally first and said like, oh, you guys want to have a, a crack at that? Want to have a try? Like, yeah, sure. Let, let me try that. The interesting thing for me was I'm more a web app kind of guy. I actually don't go too much on the operation system, operation system or binary stuff. And because of that challenge, I learned a lot about that, that area that I didn't know much. It's not like I never used Docker before. I did. I did use Docker before. I used it as a developer. I had like, um, I built Docker containers before. I had to use, I had deployed them, but I never had a chance to try to hack them. And it was a very powerful exercise to me because now I, I know a lot more about Docker in this exercise that it's been like one day than actually I used for two years before. So I really think as a builder, as developers, when you build code, you can uh, build better code if you learn how to break it. And the other way around as well. If you break your, your break code, you can be a better breaker. If you build some code, you can understand how, how the code uh, works. All right, but then you have learning and learning can only go so far. Then you have the design, right? Secure by design. So one of the things for the design is the architecture review. So sometimes the developers, they come and they say, oh, we're gonna deploy this new software, these new services, we're gonna use a different uh, cloud provider or whatever. Secure people need to be there as well, try to see what risks are in place, right? One example is uh, secret management. Secret management is such a big problem these days and can be done wrong in so many ways, right? So if developers are trying to think about a new way to do secret management, the secure people need to be there to help them to drive to a better design. Because this is one of the kind of bugs that's the architecture one. So if you get it wrong and try to fix that one year later, that's a lot harder than if you try to get it right at the first place. Um, the other way you try to do a tyro is uh, doing uh, attack trees as a trend modeling. Have you guys heard about attack trees before? Just very, just very few people. All right. So attack trees is a model to identify threats. It was uh, made popular by this guy, Bruce Schneider. So the idea is you identify the asset you're trying to protect against, right? Then you can say like, as an attacker, what do you try to do to get to that asset? So for example, you have a service in AWS where I have your user data. How would I get the user data? Oh, to get the user data, I need to have access to the database. That's the first, the first step. Okay, how would you get the access to the database? Oh, I need to get the credentials. How would you get the credentials? And so on and so far. So eventually, when you go to down to the leaf, the last leaf, you have an attack, right? That like, you just identify it just by doing this kind of exercise. So at Tyro, what they're trying to do is make the development team and the security teams to do, do this together. The security teams come with the secure expertise and the development teams come with the uh, architectural expertise, with the code expertise. So then when they together, they work together on this exercise, it's quite powerful, it's very engaging. And then you can come up with a risk of uh, a list of threats and then a list of mitigations you need to do after that. Then have secure features, right? Sometime, from time to time, the secure teams want to have some different features in your software. So for example, maybe your application doesn't have 2FA yet, and security team is like, okay, maybe we should have that for our clients. We need to push for 2FA. But we need to be mindful that as much as secure um, team has some features they want to push forward, there are other people inside the organization that want the same. We have marketing trying to push some other features. We have products trying to push some other features. So we as security people, we need to think about how do we make our feature uh, valuable for the business so we can push and prioritize together for everything else. So another little bit of a uh, story. I was working for that small startup. And once I was saying like small startup, I'm saying like 10 people startup, uh, like that small. So we had like four or five developers, two or three founders, and then one person that's uh, doing sales. As you can imagine, like we didn't have money for anything, like our laptops, we, everybody's using its own laptop. Uh, we are like in a single room, everybody like squeeze, like that kind of startup. And then what we were trying to do there is improve the secure posture. I was hired as a developer at the time, but because I was the person who had more knowledge about security, my CEO came and said, like, you know what? 
you are now our new CSO, Chief Security Officer. I was like, yeah, right, Chief Security Officer. Okay. But how, how do you improve a posture of an organization like this? They don't have resources. If I say, like, I need to get one person to work in two weeks for a feature, that's a lot of time for a startup. They, they need to deliver features, 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 like, like crazy. How do you do that? So the first thing for me is uh, I had to design how, how to who to protect against, right? My trend modeling was a boring teenager. I don't want a boring teenager run Metsploit or run like any map in you know, our applications, find a vulnerability and hack us, right? We didn't have like, we are not, uh, people we didn't have much valuable data yet. We didn't have much clients yet. So I'm most, most concerned about like uh, some sort of script KD trying to find us and then try to hack in us. So how, how would you improve our secure posture if I didn't have the resources to do that? So I started with the quick wings, right? So we're using AWS at the time, enable to FN in AWS. We're using Heroku, and Heroku can enable encryption arrest in your database if you pay a little bit more and, and uh, um, enable a flag. So you have all that stuff that you can do that's very easy, very quickly, and then it can improve your secure posture. But then you come up to a situation where it was a bit hard. Our own application has a, had a, like an admin panel that only staff members were uh, able to connect. And I really want to have like 2FA enabled for that admin panel. But if you need to develop a 2FA panel, uh, 2FA feature for ourselves, that will probably take a few weeks. And then I will, I'll bring that my CEO, uh, pretty sure like I'll be shut down. Like they'll say, no, you have other stuff that needs to be done. So what we did instead is rather than implement 2FA ourselves, we used Google, we, we implemented Google because their clients were asking to log in with Google. They didn't want to have an account. They just want like, oh, log in with Google, I'm in, right? So I convinced my manager to prioritize that, my CEO to prioritize that and put that on the roadmap because then I could remove how our accounts of our staff make everyone connect using Google and then enable 2FA at Google. So like sometimes if you're a bit creative and then you make like the security feature together for business value, it's a lot easier to push for something than only say like, oh, that's security, that's important. That's a different conversation that you have. Okay, but then you have the implementation, right? So in, in this case, we're moving a little bit to the right now, like the code, how, how we improve the code. So how do secure code? One of the ways to do it is code review. <laughs> Quality review can be a very weird process, right? Um, but it's one of the most powerful ways to find secure bugs. When I say secure bugs, it's very different to have a secure person uh, review your code than actually another developer in your team. When another developer team is reviewing your code, he's looking for many different problems. He look at the testing cover, is all right. You're like, this is code that just wrote, is readable enough. Uh, that's the solving the problem the client faces, so on and so forth. Like, has many, many concerns. When you get a secure person, the only thing that the, the person is going to look at is how do I apply this? Whatever you are building, how do I go around and do what I want? Um, but that doesn't scale very well, right? If you're any larger organizations, you probably have 40, 50, 100 developers for one secure person. So if you do that, your secure people only review code and probably gonna block how other teams to do, to do that moving forward. So what you try to do instead is review very sensitive code. So if your team is using some sort of like, oh, we are changing the password flow. We are like, oh, now we are changing how our secret management is working these kind of secure features that deal with sensitive data, then you might want to review that code, just to make sure. But you cannot review every single line of code. If you're changing some CSS on, on, on the front end, that's not gonna happen, right? Like you don't want to review that code. The other way to do that is using static analysis. And static analysis is interesting. I hate all of them, I hate all of the tools. Uh, I contribute to find site bugs, I contribute to breaking, I know how do they work internally. And it turns out like 
by definition, static analysis has your limitations. It needs to be configured very, very well. You, uh, I'm totally fine to put that in, in, and put in your um, application and make sure you catch the right stuff. But v be very careful about like false positives. You don't want to have lots of false positives like that. It generates a lot of noise that the developers are going to ignore anyway. So whatever tool you choose, make sure like it's configured to only catch uh, very accurate and precise bugs. And also be mindful that you're not going to catch everything. Like uh, it's a very limited space. You cannot do much. So you can only do so much when you're reviewing code in, in that way. So be careful of that. But do it. Important. Dependency management. That's such a big topic, right? Like I'm not going to go too much on that. But if you're doing microservices, for example, like in Tyro, we have like hundreds of services. So if you have a service, for example, that's Java and uses Spring, and then you have two or three controllers that talk to a database, right? The majority of your service code is Spring. It's not your own code. It's the library you're using. Same thing with Ruby on Rails, uh, Python and Django. All of them come up with such a huge um, class um, path, such uh, lots of codes, and they have a much uh, bigger attack surface than the code you're writing yourself. So whatever you do for dependency management, you should do it. You should break the build. You should like raise that to the developers and make sure the dependencies are are um, are being fixed. What you are trying to do at Taro is you are trying to make that an automated process. So use some sort of bot that checks if your dependencies uh, are outdated. There is a pull request and then says, "Oh, there is a new version." What what happens if I try to update? If it's green, the developer can merge and move on. Like, so then you, you decrease the friction. But the problem is uh, any company has legacy code, and what happens with this legacy code, they have old libraries. So when they find a CV of vulnerability in that, it's very, very painful to move forward. But it, it needs to be done. Don't forget about the facts and Apache Threat Studies. All right. So this, this happened at Tyro. I was reviewing some code, and this code, I was using this library called don't 4 you probably never heard about it, but it's in use uh, between uh, in Spring, in Hibernate, some other big libraries. I found, a, I found a vulnerability in there. I was like, yes, I'm going to open a CV. It was my first CV. And I said, like, I want to see what's the timeline. How, how does that work? I opened the CV. I, I, opened, I found the issue in 12 of June. Then I sent an email to the maintainer, private email, and then I said, mate, there is a problem here we need to fix. He fixed the problem, but he didn't acknowledge there was a secure problem. He just said, oh, that's a problem. It's a bug, but it's not a secure problem. I was like, yeah, it is. It's definitely a secure bug. And then I asked him, like, can I open a CV? He's like, no, 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 it's not a secure bug. I was like, mate, they're going to open a CV anyway. Then I opened a CV. So I opened a CV on 3rd of July. It took 20 days to be published on the NVD site. Everybody here knows what NVD is. Yeah? And if it is like a database of CVs, so every time you open a CV, it shows up on that website. And that's where the, the, all the tooling you have for dependency management, that's where one of the sources they have to make sure your library you're using doesn't have vulnerabilities. They check, oh, the CV here, Max Ifenio for vulnerabilities um, in your libraries inside your application. So the interesting thing about the timeline is, assuming I was the first one to find a bug, which is a pretty broad assumption. My other people might have found the bug first, but they never disclosed it. I was the first one to disclose the bug. That happened 12th of June. In Tyro, we only got notified in the uh, uh, 5th of September. It's almost three months later when we got notified by our dependence management tool. So you, you need to be mindful when you get this kind of reports. Is that right too late? It's already like very, very late. This library itself is a very small library. Nobody's looking at that. But if you talk about big frameworks like Spring, Rails, Django, you can be pretty sure that people watching every single commit that's happening there. And if they think there is a, a vulnerability in that, they are going to try to exploit it. But when you get the notification, we don't have the resources to do that ourselves. The attackers do. The attackers have the, the resources to do that. We don't. We don't. So, but you need to be mindful when you get a notification, the attackers probably already know a few weeks in advance. That's for sure. All right. 
Then we go to, to a habit, right? Like because we come up with how this is strategy and then we roll out for our company, but how we make sure we actually use that. Um, so how to do secure habits. For the secure point of view, the worst thing you can do is tell a developer how to do something. You can say like, oh, you, can, you should have dependency management, but instead you say like, uh, you should use that to dependency management, you're gonna have pushback, right? The development teams, they want to have autonomy by how they do stuff. You, as a security team, you can say, uh, that's, how I, uh, that's what I want to be done. I want to have some sort of dependency management. I need to have some sort of static analysis. We recommend these tools, but you're free to choose another tool. As long as the tool works, as long as the tool brings value, we are good with that. So they try to find contracts rather than define like how to do it. And this approach that's very similar to microservices as well. So some lots of companies, Fluka Uber, for example, they have like a, some sort of checklist. If you deploy a service, you need to have this kind of stuff done. We don't we don't care how you do it, but it should happen. Then after you define the contracts, you need to make sure it needs to be enforced on the build pipeline. You should break build, uh, the developer's code for that. You need to find a balance. You don't want to break the code every single, uh, uh, every single time they push. You don't want to break the build every single time. But if there is something critical in there, you, you should like notify the, uh, the developers. The, the build pipeline is usually the main um, path to go to production. So if you break it, you are breaking people to go to production. So make sure it's uh, worth uh, the, the blocking. Bit. Um, then I have pen testing, right? Uh, but people, when people talk about pen testing, they think about like, oh, when my software is in production, then I have people, uh, some, I hire some external consultant, and then they attack us, right? And then that's the pen testing. You can have other kinds of pen testing. You have, can have internal pen testing. You can have the, the same team. If you have the training and they capture the flag, you can have your own team try to hack your own application. Of course, it's not as good as like external pen testing, but it, it already like raised some issues and then you can fix those, right? Uh, Matt, so, uh, Matt was in his talk was talking about a, a person that found like multiple common injections and then had to pay 20,000 bucks for a, for a bug bounty, right? You could find that using your internal pen testing first and make sure when you go to the bug bounty, you only find like the really, really hard bugs to find. You don't want like to go to the bug bounty unprepared and then pay like hundreds of thousands of dollars because you haven't done your homework. Then you have the bug bounty, of course. And the bug bounty uh, is, uh, the, the right word for that, that you need to be careful because it requires a lot of work to set up a program. It requires a lot of work to try triage how this, the, the issues. It can be very beneficial, but like, I would only recommend if you like, you're more mature, you have most of the other stuff covered already. You have the dependence management, you do pen testing from time to time, then you have like your training, then you might as well do the bug bounty. Otherwise you're gonna have the same problem again you're going to pay a lot of money for your bug bounty because you didn't do your homework. So at Taro, we did a very similar, a very interesting experiment. So we get two versions of, uh, one version for software, and we uh, let the external pen testing test that. And we as a security team, we, we also tested. And then we tried to compare the reports and see like, okay, well, let's see how, who can find more, uh, most bugs, right? The finding was very interesting is because the findings itself were very different. It was not about, about like the, the quantity, it was about what each team would manage to find. Because this uh, the external pen testing has a lot of experience pen testing web applications or whatever applications the, the pen tester was testing. But they didn't have a much uh, understanding how Tyro works, how the Tyro architecture works. And we as a security team, we didn't have as much exposure to pen testing, but we did have a lot of exposure from the Tyro architecture, uh, the, uh, the Tyro network. So the both reports combined were a lot more useful than only one by itself. That's one more, more reason to have internal pen testing. They can find uh, bugs that the probably external pen testing cannot find. Okay, so we go back to our software development lifecycle review now. 
So we have like our streamline from the, from the roadmap to the client. And we have how of these that I talk about, secure features, contract, CTF, training, architecture review, how of that takes place before the build pipeline or during the build pipeline. That's Gary McGraw was saying, like the pre-deployment phase. You do how of that before the, pre uh, before the deployment. You do have some stuff that happens after the deployment, like in pen testing, bug bouncing, monitoring, uh, I didn't mention uh, in this presentation, but monitoring your attacks and the kind of stuff. But those only make sense if you feed back to whatever you have already. So if you have like the pen testing, always finding the same issues, maybe you should ch uh, change your static analysis to, to find before than the pen tester. Or you should uh, improve your training to make sure uh, your training covers that. If you're on the cloud, I hope you use infrastructure as code. I hope you have some sort of Terraform, cloud formation, whatever you do, you use code to manage your infrastructure. Even if you're on-prem, you should have at least something to help you to manage your infrastructure. Infrastructure as code is code, right? You still need code review. You, still, you, need, you have static analysis for infrastructure as code. You have dependence management. Everything you have so far, that's used for the code uh, for applications is, can be used for infrastructure as well. It doesn't change. Okay, but finally, that's a lot of work, right? Who's going to do that? Everybody, of course. Like, the security team is not like the only responsible for security. Everyone in the organization is responsible for security, right? Everybody should work together to come up with a better product. But if everybody was responsible, who is accountable? Only one. Only one person can be accountable, right? So at Tyro, what they are trying to do is um, the teams, they have a tech lead. The tech lead is accountable for the security of the application. It does, it's not responsible. The whole team is responsible, including us from security, they are responsible to make sure their products ship with a secure code, but if something is wrong or, or doesn't happen uh, at the right time or they were lacking some uh, practice, is the, is the tech lead who is uh, accountable for that. So he needs to make sure the team has the, uh, the space, the time, and the resources to do a, a good job on, on security. Okay, that was like quite a lot of stuff, but if there's three things I want to remember, these are the three things. The first one, move to the left, right? Um, if you're still doing only pen testing and only bug bounty, there's a lot of stuff you can do before that, right? Like the, um, the way you try to do a tarot is uh, if you find very simple bugs and the pen testing report for us is a failure. We should have got that before. So we try to get a look at this bug. How, how should we, uh, what should we have done to make that bug be found before that, right? So there, there is a lot of stuff to do on the left. Even if you do a bit of that, maybe review and make sure like you, you're doing more. Uh, we try, at Atari, we're always trying to, to make sure like we are doing whatever you can uh, using different tooling and, and different process. It's a big journey, right? And then some companies, they don't do any of that. And if you look on a presentation like this, or if you go look at the sense, uh, um, whether they have all the tooling, like it's a lot but you need to start from somewhere. If you don't have anything that in your organization, maybe choose one of them. Maybe dependence management and try to implement dependence management. And maybe you want to try the, the next step, one step after the other, and then eventually you come up with a, a better place. Don't, don't be um, scared by, by the amount of stuff that needs to be done. And everything here, like security is a very interesting um, field to be in because nobody wins when your competitors get hacked, right? Like, it, it, we are a bank, I don't get happy if I see other banks being hacked. Like, that's not cool. Like, the, the clients, they use uh, lost confidence on, on the banks. Um, and we need to share knowledge. We need, like, to have this kind of event, uh, help you to share knowledge. If you have anything doing uh, cool in your company, write a blog post, uh, do a presentation, uh, and help other people to, to leverage that. Nobody wins when, when we get hacked, except for the attackers, of course. That's it. That's my talk. Thank you. Questions?
You can see now. Questions? Anyone? All right, so last bit of, uh, I think no questions. Yeah, um, last bit of uh, announcements, I guess. Uh, yeah, you've got a question. Uh, let's do that. Sorry. Um, so if I have a bunch of That's, that, that's a very interesting question. So the way we do at Tyro is our security team, we divide the people by tribes, that's how we call it. So we have like a group of uh, team, uh, development teams, they respond to a tribe. And then have one, each one of us is responsible for one, two tribes. And when we have the tribe stand up, they have every week. We are there and then try to listen to see what they are doing. It. And we also have secure champions inside the teams and then have catch ups with them to, to check how, how he's doing it. So there are some things, for example, if they are not doing anything sensitive, we don't engage with them that much, but, and they might engage with other teams who are doing more secure, sensitive work. So it, it keeps changing how, uh, how often and how we engage with the teams, uh, but it depends on the work they are doing, uh, honestly. Mm. No worries. Yeah, sure. How do you how do I build? So the one, the, we have two things at, at Tyro at the moment the, for the pipeline. One is the dependency management. So if you try, for example, if you, if you try to add a new dependency that's already vulnerable, like we know that's vulnerable, it, block, it breaks the build. I uh, say like, oh, you cannot add a new dependency that's vulnerable, mate. Like, um, but if it's something that wasn't vulnerable, but it uh, just recently got a CV assigned to it, then we, we do what we call waivers. We wait for six days, for example, or two, two weeks, depends on the rating, to break your build. You get a notification, but if in two weeks you don't fix it, done, it breaks your build. Uh, we, do some, we are trying to do something similar for the stack analysis, we're still building that, but we want to make sure like the detectors we choose from, from the, um, Static analysis, they are very accurate, and then if you find those, it breaks your build as well. So that's some, some of the ideas. We haven't yet tried anything for dynamic static analysis. The kind of stuff, in my view, is uh, it takes a long time to build a pipeline. So if, like, for example, the developed teams they had a pipeline of 20 minutes, and now it's taking 45 because of that dynamic static analysis, you'll not be a very popular guy for them. So like, we need to be very mindful of that as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. See on that? No? Cool. Fantastic. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, quick notification. There will be, uh, I believe, a little table with some biscuits and some nibbles outside over here. Otherwise, the area upstairs, the area where you went for lunch, will have coffee as well. The same coffee and nibbles upstairs, only nibbles downstairs. There's only one coffee station there. There we go. All right, we've got a half an hour break, and then we're going to come back in here at 4 o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you, mate. Thank you very much. I just saw your tattoo. That's all. Oh, yeah. Uh, I live in India. Oh, did you? Yeah. Right, I'll talk to you Yeah. Oh, thank you. I just had a question afterwards. Can we have a organization, the tribe model, I think, is great. That's the way it's going to the challenge in our organization is um, we're funded by the size of it. You've got them in funding, who funds your team? Because our organization is a of recharge. Yeah. And the size is saying, you're doing the dev work, you should pay for my time. But on the security people are thinking, they're never, you know, the dev team have enough cost to bear, so they're not going to pay for you. How does it work in Cairo in terms of yeah. the funding of the role? That's a good question. Um, what we do is, um, we don't have a CSO. We have like a head of engineering, head of operations. Yeah, yeah. My team works 
where application security works with uh, inside the head of the world. Okay, so like so, CTO, so you're inside the technology yes. office? Yes, kind of, kind of, kind of. And, and then uh, we have more like OSAC compliance kind of team, and they respond to the head of the first. Got it. Uh, but then like, then so you're not, you're not close to the assurance team, but you're much closer to the yeah, the engineering or build teams or whatever than the actual traditional assurance and government. Yeah, yeah, but both of us, but the same things are found in like, I, as a, just a different team, right? Like, for example, when they do the budget, they say like, I need five people, six people to have the budget for that. Yeah. And that's it. Uh -huh. It is the form of effect. The form is the cost of doing business. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. I think that's what we're trying to promote yeah. internally is just have acceptance and cost of doing yeah. business. Trying to get recharge and things like that. Yeah. I, I was thinking that I was talking like my manager the other day, if you should have the CI so for example. Uh, we have the trade offs is like it depends. In our case is we get lots of advantage if we're doing inside the engineering team. Mm. We are seen as part of them. Like yeah, it's just the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like, so we will work with them again. For, if you compare our <laughs> with the developers, we compare it to the compliance people, the developers. So it's very different. Yeah, yeah. It's very different. It's still a bear. Because like I used to be a developer at Cairo and then I moved to security. So like they know they know me. Like I have worked with a few of them. Even if I never worked with they know like oh you know, the case yeah, they well. yeah. yeah. And when people come from a different background, like oh this Secure person doing PCI compliance yeah, and stuff. So, they're like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? And so one of the challenges we have is like to try to make these two groups. Mm -hmm. My one chance on my team like get more closely yeah, together. Yeah. yeah. No, that's good. Good uh, yeah. feedback. I'll take that uh, back at home. Anyway. Cool. Thanks, man. Thank you. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, that was good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, man. Sorry, I was talking about manager. Ah, that's all right. Yeah. So, so you stayed in India. I think it's six months in India. Ah, that's an interesting time. Yeah. Good. <laughs> hey. Uh, I've got a question about. Because Taro, it's a, yeah. it's a system that sort of integrates. You're dealing with, with a lot of uh, point of sale vendors and so on, right? So, what are the challenges in, say, Thank you. Um, integrating with sort of people, especially from a security standpoint? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, we try to do, the thing is, we cannot change our partner, right? Like, um, so we can, we can only go so far. But we try, for example, for the net, a network level, we try to whatever talks to the partner to be in a different network. We have a bit more monitoring on that. And then everything that we receive from the partners, we try like sonatize and make sure like uh, everything is, um, is protected by default. But for example, one of the partners we have is, they don't have a um, key for a merchant, for example. So, so we can like if an attacker can can attack us and then like get the, the only key we have, they can get access to all merchants. But then like that's we don't have a way to do that. We, we fix that on our own side, make sure like the merchant only can get change, uh, get the data that's belonging to the merchant. But we only have we have to leave that like uh, we, we raise with them. We say like oh we need we need, we need to do better. Um, but it is what it is. Sorry. Has that ever been, been an issue where, say, because uh, I never affect the point of sales centers, are just vulnerable as all hell, yeah. and there are just a million of them uh, just in, say, hospitality alone, and they say, we want to retail to show tariffs, they've seen tariffs in Yeah. Like, has that ever been the case where they were, have been compromised and someone's actually compromised, say, like a terminal and used that to do silly things with Tyro? No, not yet. It doesn't uh, seem like something they could, because I don't know how well like, the, the FPOS has worked on it. Um, what could they really, what could they realistically do anyway? Like, does it seem like there's too much? What they can try to do is, the only thing they can try to do is, uh, from the Tyro perspective, they have integration to the Tyro the terminal. Yeah. But everything needs to go to the tire server before. Yeah. So the so for example, you can say like, oh, there's this transaction going to show up in the terminal. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Like, okay. They can mess up if the data that shows up on yeah, the terminal. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Worst thing, it was, they could just put through a bunch of transactions on this. Like, yeah. Yeah, on the terminal itself, but yeah, you still need somebody to like to pay it and then like change the yeah, terminal. Yeah, that still seems okay. Like, yeah, we have problems um, more regarding like um, fraud. People like trying to get the terminal and do lots of the transactions and rebate and the cut stuff. Oh, like the, the venue owners do that all? Uh, no, some people like know the, uh, they think like they're fake the, some documentation, they submit and then, then we give them a terminal and then they use the terminal to do transactions and they like, they mess up the terminal and then they disappear. 
they get the money and they oh, just social engineering yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we do have that but you are getting better like uh, protecting those things but uh, I never heard anything like random kind of post like uh, yeah there would be no you. no need, the transaction needs to go to the terminal at the end of the day you know because my my experience with Tower and hospital industry is that it is definitely prepared to prefer to like Whatever the banks give you in PCF plus, mm. which is just shoddy and looks like it's from the nineties, it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we we actually change our terminals now. We're getting some some new terminals uh, in the future. Oh really? Yeah. Right. And outside from the one they what the kind of one's called, there's the big one and there's the smaller one. Yeah. Yoximo and something else. Yeah. No, we are we are moving that together. We know like our terminals are kind of. <laughs> uh, old, so we are getting new ones. What's from them though? Like they, they, they seem to be pretty. They seem to do like what they do pretty well. They do, but for example, if you look at the CBA, they have a much better experience, like uh, with the iPad kind of stuff. Like, did you did you have seen that? Sorry, what about iPads? The the CBA one, they have like some sort of iPad. Like, CBA has iPads. Yeah, then you can put like this, and then you see the the, the print of the receipt and kind of stuff. Some sort of iPad, like it's running, uh, Combank. Combank, yes. Combank's Albert. But Commonwealth Bank, the, yeah. the Albert Terminal, just things suck too. They have different terminals. One, one of the newest one is the exactly. iPads. Oh, they have iPads now, don't they? Yeah. So Albert's striking. They really do suck. Yeah. Like every, uh, what we think by the way, mm. um, every like venue that we've seen with Albert always has some sort of, even the ones that are not even integrated, they, they, they just misbehave or they just touch them. It's, it's pretty silly. I see. I see. Yeah, just, anyway, that'll yeah. do it. Cool. Thanks so much, Mario. No worries. Thank you.